Do you remember that time Alex and I talked about that C. Bono 76-yard run? That time Buddy Ryan ran the 46 defense, which essentially reduced the entire Arizona Cardinals defense to a casserole of bodies, and allowed the slowest man on earth to go on a leisurely nature hike all the way across the field, with nobody to keep him company but his right tackle and a referee? Well, there was a side story that we cut out of the script of that episode. We had to, because otherwise we would have gotten totally lost in it. But we also knew it had to be its own episode one day. It happened 16 years later, and coincidentally, it also involved a member of the Ryan family squaring off against the Chiefs. What we're about to see is two things at the same time. It's one of the stupidest drives you'll ever see in the NFL. It happened in the middle of a blowout, it had absolutely no effect on the game's outcome. And yet, in its own accidental way, it sent seismic waves throughout the league that we still feel today. This five minute, three second drive had a significant hand in changing the entire course of NFL history. Yeah, the colors are green this time. You're about to enter New York Jets territory. This is your final warning. The New York Jets had been aimlessly pursuing glory for decades as the 2008 NFL season wound down. After a promising 8-3 start, they were doomed by a 39-year-old quarterback rocking a torn biceps and totally fell apart down the stretch. It was time for the organization to hit the reset button going into the 2009 offseason and go on the prowl for a new coach and quarterback. To serve as coach, they hired Buddy Ryan's baby boy Rex, the man who just coordinated the Ravens' defense to the AFC Championship game where his unit held up its end of the bargain, allowing just one touchdown in Pittsburgh. A few months later, New York traded up into the top five of the NFL draft, determined to land USC's Mark Sanchez as Ryan's quarterback for this new era of Jets football. Powered by their ground-and-pound offense that led the league in rushing, and one of the greatest pass defenses in the 21st century, the Jets instantly became a smashing hit. After reaching just one AFC Championship game in the preceding 26 years, they cruised all the way to the conference title game in Ryan's very first season, then did it again the next. The Jets were now in a renaissance, experiencing something long foreign to them, consistent winning. Expectations soared heading into year three. Then Sanchez's play provided even more reason for optimism. See, the Jets had just made back-to-back -back AFC Championship games despite the play of Sanchez, who was one of the NFL's worst quarterbacks his first couple years. But a few months into the 2011 season, he was just starting to show signs of being able to pass for an actual NFL starting quarterback. Built for January football, the Jets just needed to sneak into the tournament for a chance to make some serious noise. And after winning seven of their first 12 games, they were right in the thick of the playoff picture for a shot to build upon their percolating mini-dynasty when they welcomed the Chiefs to town. Kansas City featured a third-year coach of their own. Todd Haley had taken over a Chiefs franchise that had been buried in the NFL's basement. For three consecutive seasons, including the first of Haley's tenure, the Chiefs had failed to break the four-win barrier. To this day, it's one of just eight times a team in the 16-game era has experienced a three-year run this bad. These other seven teams took years to recover. None of them immediately righted the ship and cruised into the playoffs in year four, except for Todd Haley's Chiefs. He's the only one to ever orchestrate a turnaround like this with a team like that. It was a miracle, not only because they jumped straight from four wins to ten, but because they leapt over the San Diego Chargers, who boasted not only the NFL's number one offense, but the number one defense. Unfortunately for them, they were abandoned by God, suffered a series of catastrophes on special teams, screeched to a halt at 9-7, and, and opened the door for KC. Now, year three of the Todd Haley era wasn't going quite as well. They'd stumbled to 5-7 and seven entering Week 14's contest in the Meadowlands, but part of that was owed to the fact that the Chiefs had lost starting quarterback Matt Castle to injury. 
we find ourselves in the third quarter of this game. The Chiefs are getting stomped, 28-3, but again, Haley is having to make do with backup quarterback Tyler Palco on the road, and this Jets team is an AFC powerhouse, and Haley is less than a year removed from bringing the mess of a team he inherited all the way to the playoffs. One loss, however lopsided, shouldn't put him on the hot seat, right? The Jets take over at their own 10-yard line after a Chiefs punt. It's first and 10 as they start their drive, and all appears to be more or less normal in the football universe. Sanchez drops back and checks the ball down to tailback Sean Green for a short gain, but the officials flag fullback John Connor for a chop block. Not a good call, as Connor's low block comes when the defender's not engaged with another blocker, which is legal. Nevertheless, that pushes the Jets back five yards and forces them to replay first down. Green then takes a handoff and bounces it outside for a nice pickup, but extra lineman Vladimir Dukas gets flagged for holding on the play, backing the Jets up another 72 inches and compelling a third crack at first down from the three-yard line. Green then plows his way forward for a five-yard gain, and this time it's not for naught. On second down, Sanchez misses wide on a comeback route to Plaxico Burris, but gets bailed out when a blow to the head results in a 15-yard penalty against KC. With a fresh set of downs at their own 23, Jets offensive coordinator Brian Schottenheimer dials up a screen for Green. Realizing they're ill-prepared and a big play would be looming, Chiefs DN Tyson Jackson just sorta bear hugs Green to prevent him from getting loose for the pass. Savvy move to prevent an even bigger play, but that draws a flag for holding. Oh, and so does linebacker Demario Williams' attempt at downfield coverage. Only one of those two is allowed to be enforced, advancing New York to the 28, but Haley ensures the enforcement of another penalty with some magic words to the officials to earn the rarest of rare flags. An unsportsmanlike conduct called against a coach which moved the Jets all the way to the 43. For those scoring at home, this drive has now seen a football get snapped five times and a yellow hanky hit the ground six times. A couple of Sean Green carries set up a third down at midfield. Sanchez looks toward Burris to make a play and move the chains, and he does by drawing P.I. on corner Brandon Flowers, bumping the Chiefs' penalty yardage total on the drive to 51. The very next snap, the Jets take a shot for six, but safety Kendrick Lewis loses track of the ball and impedes tight end Dustin Keller, a back-breaking 30-yard spot foul that moves the Jets inside the five. A fade to Burris is legally broken up by Brandon Carr before an inside handoff to Green picks up a yard. On third down, the Red Sea parts for Sanchez, who punctuates this bizarro drive by scurrying in for the score. A few minutes ago, the Jets had the ball at their own three, 97 yards from Pater. Their offense gained a grand total of just nine net yards. They still made it here. This sucks so bad. It's a masterpiece. The New York Jets had somehow cobbled together a 97-yard touchdown drive out of a five-yard penalty against them, a two-yard penalty against them, a five-yard gain, a four-yard gain, a three-yard gain, a one-yard gain, and a three-yard gain. They did it with nine net yards. That's not even enough for a single first down. Technically, it's only a 90-yard drive since they started from the 10, four penalties, put him back at the 3, but since it's functionally 97, let's just call it 97. The sports reference tool StatHead allows us to search drive data back to 2001. These are the penalty yardages of every touchdown drive in the last 20 years in which the offense started on its own 3. Over here, you see some teams that actually had to gain more than 100 yards because penalties bumped them back. Most of these drives involved no penalties at all. A few received substantial help, but no other 97-yard drive in this era, or probably any other, has come anywhere close to the 81 penalty yards picked up by the Jets at around 3 p.m. on December 11th, 2011. 
Committing 81 yards worth of penalties on a single drive is a remarkable feat in and of itself. In over a quarter of the NFL's 256 games that season, 65 to be exact, both teams combined for fewer than the 81 penalty yards the Chiefs got nailed for just on that one drive. A drive that started with penalties called on back-to-back -back plays against the Jets that pushed them back to the three in the first place. New York then ultimately engineered a touchdown drive on a possession that started 90 yards from the end zone, despite their offense producing just 16 yards from scrimmage. In the more than 1,000 touchdown drives in the NFL since 2001 that featured no more than 16 yards from scrimmage, only three others started from even 70 yards away. Yeah, that was a really weird drive. It's one of the weirdest drives we've ever seen. It's about to get a lot more weird. See, this drive was the turning point for both teams involved. For both the Chiefs and the Jets, nothing would ever be the same. First, Kansas City. How did the years that followed turn out the way they did? I'm gonna lay out a case that I think is a convincing one, but of course, you can be the judge of that. The day after this game, the Chiefs fired Todd Haley. Strictly on paper, this is kinda shocking. Canning a coach midseason is certainly nothing new, it's happened 35 times in the 21st century alone. But here's how the last three seasons went for Haley, and on average, the 34 others. Typically these coaches deliver pretty mediocre results in the third to last and the second to last seasons before completely cratering in the season they get fired, averaging around four projected wins. Meanwhile, Haley orchestrated a complete franchise turnaround in year two. And even in year three, he was still performing significantly better than your average coach who gets fired midseason. He was on track for about six wins, which is not good, but is still way better than the vast majority of coaches who get shown the door before the season's over. His neighbors on this chart are mostly either guys who had been around a long time and weren't meeting expectations anymore, or guys who had never delivered at all. Haley was neither. He was only in year three, and he was navigating the wilderness with a backup quarterback, which you think would earn him some slack. Oh, hey, look who it is. Anyway, on top of all this, the Chiefs were still mathematically alive in the playoff hunt after that loss. We can probably agree that Haley's firing was extremely unusual, but certain coaches have that it factor that makes them eminently fireable. And I think we can find Haley's in the words of Chief CEO Clark Hunt. Those penalties against the Jets, specifically the call against Haley, got a lot of attention. Hunt nodded specifically to quote-unquote inconsistent play in that particular game, and I think we all know what inconsistent play is code for. Penalties. The primary symptom of a lack of discipline. The thing a coach is expected to maintain above all else. Penalties. 81 yards of them in a single drive. It wasn't the 5-8 and eight record. Those happen all the time. I think this drive is what did him in. Now, if we can agree on that, we can appreciate how these few minutes changed the NFL forever. Here's where we really get wild. To finish out the season, the Chiefs promoted defensive coordinator Romeo Cornell to interim head coach. Having previously served as Cleveland's head coach and finished with an unimpressive 24-40 record, Cornell immediately pounced on the opportunity. In his very first game, the Chiefs shocked the NFL by upsetting an undefeated Packers team that looked well on their way to 16-0. It won him the full-time job the next season, the Chiefs went 2-14, and, and Cornell himself was fired at season's end. Now, if it weren't for that penalty fest, it's reasonable to believe that the Chiefs would have let Haley finish out the season before firing him. Cornell never would have had the chance to pull off that stunning upset, and the team would have started looking for a new head coach in earnest entering 2012. If they actually hit the open market to get their coach of the future instead of just retaining their interim coach, whoever they hire is almost certain to keep the job for multiple seasons. Which means that in 2013, the chair would not be open for this man. The big fella changed everything. Andy Reid's Chiefs immediately reversed course, winning their first nine games in 2013, and never looked back. Under the Reid administration, the Chiefs have won more games than any team in the NFL but the Patriots. He was there to help pull all the strings to land Patrick Mahomes, already one of the most transformative football players of all time. He's led Kansas City to back-to-back -back Super Bowls, and more seem likely. Fortunes can change very quickly in this league, but it's possible that at the end of it, we'll know these Chiefs as one of the all-time great NFL dynasties. Largely because of Andy Reid. 
who surely would have been snatched up by another team had the Chiefs not had a head coach vacancy in 2013, which they only had after firing Romeo Cornell, who was only there because of a signature win as an interim coach, which he only was because Todd Haley was fired days prior, which he only was at that particular time in large part because the day before, his team made what might be the most undisciplined defensive stand in NFL history. Thank you, Todd. Meanwhile, Sanchez and the Jets emerged from this game appearing in pretty good shape. Their young QB was dangerously close to finally playing at a league average level, and they were sporting the league's ninth best point differential with an 8-5 record that had them in pole position to snag the AFC's second wildcard spot. Everything was going swimmingly, until they had to go play more football, or whatever it is they played thereafter. It's as though the Jets thought that moving forward, they could simply keep riding that conveyor belt O penalty to scores. But the belt stopped, and New York had no plan B to effectively traverse the field, such as by passing the football, or perhaps by running with the football. Unable to move the ball via more traditional means immediately following that Chiefs game, down the stretch of the season's final weeks, Sanchez took a complete nosedive, sinking down to sub Seneca Wallace and John Skelton levels. Levels no one ever wants to be. And he dragged his team down with him. The Jets lost all three of their remaining games with a point differential in that time that was third worst in the league, in the process, tumbling out of the playoff picture. By the next season, dysfunction had fully enveloped the organization. They traded for Tim Tebow, Sanchez started fumbling after running into his right guard's ass before getting benched and flaming out, and following a torn ACL suffered by star corner Darrell Rivas, they traded their best player away. And that was it for them. After squandering that golden opportunity to make the playoffs in 2011, the Jets have been waiting around for a decade plus for another chance. The Chiefs can argue that this one cartoonish drive at the butt end of yet another lost season was the catalyst for their eventual dynasty in the making. And while this drive didn't actually pull any switches that landed the Jets where they are today, they can look back and know that this was the summit. This drive, this moment, it was their final touchdown of their final victory as a team on the way up. Nearly everything since has gone wrong for them. It's as though these teams found a way to play football on such a chaotic frequency that it sent blast waves throughout the annals of history, wrecking one would-be dynasty and launching another. So, the next time you see something like this, something this hauntingly stupid, Something that seems like it belongs to another, even dumber sport. Watch out. The plates might be shifting. 